familiar with Dan Rail will, I presume, come along for a walk or a run or come to the playground. Uh, and more recently, we've had the uh, tea room open at uh, the court building itself. Um, and we have about 100,000, 120,000 people coming to uh, the park every year for recreational purposes alone. Uh, but the, the whole cultural and uh, historical side of the park has yet to be presented uh, to the public. And it's a history that goes back to about 1660 when the first St. Ledger came here, Sir William St. Ledger, uh, and he uh, came as the first Lord President, well, he was the first St. Ledger as a Lord President of Munster. And you might think that that is a, a modern term, but it was used by the Crown to denote a governor of a region. So we had a Lord President in Munster, we had one in Connacht, uh, supposed to have one in Ulster, but that didn't happen. There was one in Wales and there was one in Scotland. And it worked very well for the Tudor government for about 100 years, from about 1570 to 1670. And from about the 1620s, um, the St. Ledgers and their descendants actually held sway in Munster. Uh, and they had the position for about 50 years. So they were an important family. And when Ledger came here first, he didn't build a house on the south side, as we will see later. Uh, there was a tower house just here, uh, owned by the Sinans. You're familiar with tower houses. They're about 700 years old. It would have been three, four story, a square building. Uh, but in the 17th century, uh, William St. Ledger built a manor house adjacent to that. And as Lord President, he had full control in terms of law, in terms of administration, uh, in terms of you know, the, the military capacity of, of the region. So he was an important person. Not only that, he was uh, on first name terms with the Duke of Buckingham, who was effectively the regent. Charles I wanted to go off and look at his artwork and so forth in Europe. Uh, and he left the administration, the day-to-day -day administration of England and Ireland to the Duke of Buckingham. And of course, William St. Ledger was his land agent in Ireland, so that was a, a strong uh, relationship. But also, uh, William St. Ledger was very close to the first Earl of Cork, Richard Boyle. And immediately you can see the significance of the triumvirate. You have St. Ledger here, Munster, uh, a good friend at court and the most powerful man in Ireland also a good friend and as part of that um, as one would expect they developed what one can only say is one of the most significant um, gardens in Munster and this is a map of this area which dates to about 1728 and this shows what this area looked like in the previous century and we are standing literally on this black line here, which is the first terrace. And you can see it here, it drops about two meters or so. There was another terrace down here, which is just before the trees, and another terrace below the trees, just before you got to the river. So it's an extensive garden. It runs to about six acres or so. And the only comparable garden that we have in Ireland today would be at Lismore. And of course, you can see the relationship immediately. You had the first Earl of Cork developing that garden in the 1630s while he was visiting here as well with the St. Ledgers. We've worked out that it took about 30,000 tons of material uh, to build up these terraces. And we know that from surveys we've done. And also, I'll show you on the outer wall here, on the inside it's about three meters high, but on the outside it's about five meters high. And as you get closer, the style of this tells us that's about 1660s. And at this time, the Boyles and the St. Ledgers, and a very important Gaelic Irish family, the O'Briens, married into each other. Uh, and we actually had the families of three earls involved um, in Donnery at that time. So today we do not have the castle, we do not have the, or the manor should I say, or the tower house. Um, we have the location of these buildings and we hope in the near future to carry out an archaeological dig uh, 
to investigate uh, their foundations. But as to the gardens, uh, the walls are intact, they're brick lined inside, uh, all of the features that were there in the 1660s are here today. You'll also notice that there's a wall and this wall is still standing and in that wall you can see a bricked up arch and what one could do was take a boat in, pick people up at the bottom of the steps and take a boat out again into the river. So this expansion of the river was done solely for garden purposes and dates back as I say to 1660. The 17th century was a, a turbulent period as some of you might know and the castle here was sacked in 1645 by the Confederates. They rebuilt, um, as we said, we have the St. Ledger's back here in the 50s and 60s, but it was sacked again in the 1690s during the Williamite Wars. And it was at that point that the St. Ledger's decided to move to the south side uh, of the river and build the court as we know it now, um, and to leave this as an orchard, effectively. Now, you wouldn't want to be building this today. <laughs> We're standing on the outside wall, just about here, in line with this terrace. And you can see how the wall comes along horizontally, falls down, and then runs along horizontally again. So this marks the front of a terrace, just like the one that we were standing on. Same thing as well, the um, angle at 45 degrees to uh, denote the front of the terrace. Inside, the uh, ground is at about two meters higher than what we're looking at here. So the ground is about there. And to, to keep the wall in place and keep the pressure of soil in place, this wall is battered in you know, 1660s Ireland. Uh, many of us would have been living in you know, little uh, cabins. Something like this uh, would have been of great significance. Uh, and it's underlined by the fact that William St. Ledger's daughter, Elizabeth, married Murrow O'Brien. Some of you might be familiar with that name, but uh, he was known in circumstances, uh, some circumstances as Murrow the Burner because of his warring activity. But he was also um, a member of the Privy Council of Charles I in exile in Paris during the 1650s. Uh, you remember Cromwell was in Ireland in the 1650s and there was a parliamentary type government in place. So the king was in exile and he had a privy council or council of about 12 members. And so Inchiquin was one of 12 and he was in a very important uh, place. He and his wife who uh, became Earl and Countess of Inchiquin in the early 1660s. Uh, and that's uh, an important point because it was at this time, in the late 1650s and in the early 1660s, that Louis XIV was developing Versailles. And we can show direct links uh, between the patterns we see here on the parterres and Versailles. And we believe that the, the reason for the building of the garden is a coming together of uh, the Boyle family, uh, new money, if you will, uh, of the Munster Plantation, and the O'Brien family, an old Celtic family from Tormund, from Clare, uh, and it was through the St. Ledger's that they married. Uh, so that is what we believe um, to be the significance of the gardens. Uh, the, the people involved here were closely linked to Hampton Court, uh, through the Boyles, through uh, in terms of date and in terms of uh, style, uh, we're now moving on to a parkland style. Um, the elite moved away from in large enclosed garden spaces for a number of reasons. One, it was hugely expensive uh, to keep all of the grass and topiary and so forth. Uh, but also there was a, a wider appreciation of nature. Uh, and in the late 17th century and early 18th century, people began to develop parkland type gardens, and that's what we'll walk into now.
reklama. And all the deer were fallow, they were brought in uh, from estates in England. Um, currently, as you can see here, it's a bit muddy in front. Uh, the OPW are taking away the bank edges, they've built up with silt over time. So we hope to have that um, tidied up in the next two months. somewhat broader and the cascade which is entirely man-made is directly in front of the house uh, and you, you can see all of it is planned. Now just a little word about the St. Ledger's. Uh, some of you might have heard one or two stories about them but uh, I'm only going to spend about 30 seconds. Uh, there were 14 generations of St. Ledger's and uh, at the minute very little is known about individual um, generations. Uh, the research is, is ongoing. Uh, of the, that 14 generation, um, there were about 11 generations were Viscounts. The first Viscount was established in 1703. So from 1703 until about six, uh, 1956 was the last, the death of the last Viscount. Uh, and just a word on, on Viscounts because it, it's important uh, here. You might be familiar with a couple of words from the peerage, but you would start with being a baron. Uh, and if you simply link the word to an area of ground, it's a useful way of, of remembering it. So a baron would have uh, a barony, a viscount would have a vice county or half a county, a count would have a county, uh, and so on. So it's as simple as that. <laughs> so you had an earldom and then you had a dukedom. So the more land you had, the more important you were. So they were second on the, on the rung, as it were, uh, and stayed there through the generations. And then one must ask the question, you know, how did they have the wherewithal to develop all of this? Uh, the income from the estate varied from about £3,000 to £7,000 per annum, depending on, on the time. Uh, and that isn't sufficient to you know, maintain this, even in those times. But the, the St. Ledger's married well. They married into the Earls of Donegal and the Earls of Bristol the Earls of Bandon, and we're still researching one to one. So uh, every so often there was an influx of, of money, and that kept the, the place going. <laughs> now in front of the court, this building is shown on the 1730s map as a two-story, three-bay building. So it was a, a secondary house uh, on the domain. Uh, if you remember the, the guard is here, this is it here, uh, at the head of what's called Fish Pound Lane. And you can see that this lane runs right in front of us and goes down to the fish ponds. Now the fish ponds have a life and a history of their own. We have, again, records of Richard Boyle giving uh, small numbers, that must be said, of Tench and Cark to William St. Ledger, again in the late 1620s. And these fish would have come from the Low Countries by boat in, in barrels, and there would have been a huge mortality rate. So he actually notes in his diary gave ten tench to William St. Ledger today, and these things were, you know, invaluable. But these fish stocked the early fish ponds, and if you now know the fish ponds as these, this form of stretch of water, over time this uh, road in front of the house became a nuisance, so it was closed off. Uh, and uh, there is a, a residual right of way into the village. Um, I don't want to follow where this pub. It wasn't there at the time, uh, it was built subsequently. But when they moved to this side of the river first, the main entrance was there. It became fashionable then, having parkland, to have a long home drive. Uh, and we know that the Triumphal Arch, the large entrance, if you're not familiar with it, it's up the hill on the right. It was the current Triumphal Arch was built in the 1820s, but 
uh, stylistically it could go back to the 1770s where we're investigating that at the moment. But the entrance from the Triangle Arch uh, came across the Spanish uh, chestnut there, went down to the avenue bridge and came back up and it was about a mile in front. And that was a very fashionable 18th century thing. Moving now from the parkland into what we call the court gardens. Uh, and uh, this is a space behind us here which uh, is yet to be open to the public. We're working on that. We'll see a small bit of it in a minute. But there are again about 20 acres of gardens behind this coach house going south. And uh, just to orientate yourselves, um, we are at all times running parallel to the main street. And it's, uh, it may be difficult to believe, but uh, this is the main street. And we've just literally done a walk about 200 meters inside the wall, and we're going through all of this history. Uh, this was the courtyard, uh, the house in the 18th century was much smaller, and we had a small enclosed space here. And the, the boundary wall at the time would have come in line with this building, so you'd have had a small enclosure here. As time moved on, uh, we talked earlier about the Triumphal Arch. Uh, the Lord of the day decided that he wanted an entrance at the top of the town. So at that time, all the gardens from the village were backing onto uh, this boundary wall here. So what he did in, in royal fashion was he took about 20 meters off every garden and <laughs> built that uh, avenue right to the top. So, you know, planning of the day. Uh, the stables, uh, the uh, St. Ledger's were in the fox hunting, the celebrated story about the fort by the fox and so forth. Um, they had uh, large stables behind this wall here. They're not now in, in the hands of the state, but they could stable about 50 horses. This was the tack house. Uh, that's an inner gate lodge. And this here is an early 19th century coach house. Um, as time went on, successive generations of uh, the <coughs> St. Ledger's got more and more interested in plants. And in the 19th century, the Turge Viscount and the Fort Viscount were renowned for their plant collections. And they developed gardens then, which go all the way up to what we now call New Road. This is New Road at the top of the town. And these gardens extend from here all the way up along. And we have another stop where we'll show you here part of those gardens and uh, tell you a little bit more of that story. So if you go up the avenue, um, it's a red door on your left hand side. Okay, this is what's known as the, uh, the Victorian Parterre Garden. These box hedges in particular would be about 100 years old. Um, these are the gardeners' cottages, uh, and these spaces would have been used for herbs mostly, um, and, and, and flowers as well. Um, the gardens here are extensive. Um, we've seen you know, the uh, 17th century gardens, we've seen the 18th century parkland. You've only seen a very, very small part of that parkland, and after this, if you have the time, it's well worth walking, particularly to the east of the of the house uh, to go down to what we call the fish ponds and back up. All of that was um, ornamented as a pleasure ground. Late 18th century. The gardens here were productive gardens. We have behind us here the outline of uh, a glass house. And for those of you who can see, um, there's a, a wall just about 100 meters up here. Um, that was another phase of development. There's another wall beyond that, another 250 meters beyond that, uh, another phase of development. And beyond that again, there's another 400 meters uh, of gardens. So uh, it, it covers about 20 acres or so and developed from 1730s up to about 19, uh, 1890. Um, we have uh, in the top garden, uh, the only bespoke Robinson gar um, glass house uh, from the 1880s. Uh, Robinsons were uh, a renowned um, glass house uh, maker from Glasgow, and uh, we apparently have the only one in Ireland which we hope uh, to restore. But I suppose more importantly, uh, and we're also 
researching this at the minute. Through the 1850s, 60s and 70s, uh, the St. Ledger's uh, here had a very close relationship with uh, Kew, Kew Gardens in London. Uh, there was uh, Dr. John Hooper and subsequently his son. Uh, he was director in the 1850s and the St. Ledger's developed uh, a very strong relationship uh, through a chap called Lennox Cunningham. Uh, he was father to uh, Lady Castletown. Uh, who was one of the wives of the St. Ledger's, uh, and he was a clerk, a senior clerk, at the Foreign Office in London. So he had immediate and daily access to the Empire uh, in the late 19th century. Uh, he had direct access to all the embassies and consulates, and would write out on a weekly basis uh, to an ambassador seeking seeds for his daughter in Donnery. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was a worldwide expedition. And explorers of the day, and th there are many, and if you open any uh, plant hunter book, uh, you'll see uh, all the key names, and they were all linked back to Donnery with parcels they would send back mm -hmm. to the embassies, to the Foreign Office in London. And uh, what Lennox Cunningham would do would be to split the parcel, <laughs> half would go to Kew and the other half would come to Dunham. And that was ongoing for about 20 years or so, uh, uh, to the point where uh, Lady Castletown at one point writes to Hooper and says, we now have a mini Kew at Dunham. <laughs> so these gardens are important uh, in their own right uh, to support the uh, house. Uh, to support the domain. Uh, out here, for instance, we have uh, the Nine Walk, one of the few in the country, uh, and uh, a whole range of exotic trees and shrubs. So it was a nursery for that, but also it was effectively um, a Kew Gardens uh, in Ireland, and that isn't uh, generally known. So we, we have now walked through 400 years of garden history uh, in about an hour or so. Uh, in the 17th century, uh, the only other garden in Ireland that could have, that one could compare, I guess, uh, to the garden at Donnery is that at Lismore. Uh, in the 18th century, the so-called capability brown landscape was more common, certainly, but here in Donnery, uh, its style started in the early 18th century. Capability Brown didn't really get into his own until 1750, and he was at his peak between 1750 and 1770. He never came to Ireland. Uh, it's just that the parkland style became known as the Capability Brown style. But uh, we can show definitely that Donnerill was developing that in the 1730s. And again, in the Irish context, while there were many domains, uh, it was quite large uh, in the context of the day uh, and it also had and continues to have a wide range of domain features. We have all of the walls in place, we have triumphal arch entrances, we have gate lodges, uh, hahas to keep the deer in place, um, the fish ponds which are very early and large ornamental ponds uh, and then moving late uh, 18th century, early 19th century, expansive gardens here. Um, all of the work had been done outside, as it were. All of the structure was put in place, and the fashion of the day was to come in and find exotic plants and show them off to your neighbours and so forth. So, for each of the centuries that uh, Donnerill has been here, it was up there. It was fashionable, it was top of the league, and today we have that inheritance and that inheritance is unique. We have the assemblage of fashionable spaces from all of those centuries.